Hi, it's Mr. Anderson, and in this podcast, I'm going to talk about DNA fingerprinting. We sometimes refer to this as DNA profiling or your genetic fingerprint. And basically, it started with this guy, Alec Jeffries. Basically, in his lab, he was working with x-ray and looking at um, DNA. And what he figured out is he could tell a lot about a person by their looking at their DNA, quote-unquote, fingerprint. In other words, he could see who they were related to or who they weren't. Um, he could tell paternity, for example. And so he was working at the University of, University of Leicester and basically figured out this whole idea of DNA fingerprinting. This is around 1984. And basically for the next three years, all DNA fingerprinting on the planet went through this university. And so eventually it was privatized and this is everywhere. And it'll probably eventually be replaced by just DNA sequencing, sequencing all the letters in DNA. But to make it understandable, essentially what we have in a human is we have long linear segments of, of DNA, but within that we have these genes. And so 99.9% .9 of our DNA in everyone is going to be exactly the same. The genes are going to be the same, but you're, again, you're going to have different copies or alleles of those genes. That's what makes you you. But if we look into this area in the middle, we used to call this junk DNA, but now we know it's really important in controlling gene expression we find that there's quite a bit of variability in here, which shouldn't surprise us because this, the gene, makes the protein and the protein makes the phenotype and that's really what natural selection is selecting for or against. But this in the middle can go crazy and so it does. And so an example of one that we use in DNA fingerprinting is something called short tandem repeats. Uh, originally we started with something called VNTR, variable number tandem repeats, and you'll find in DNA sequencing that you have all kinds of, so we had STRs, we have VNTRs, before that we had restriction, fragment length, uh, polymorphisms, and so there's a bunch of different things that we could look at, but we've kind of moved to this idea of these short tandem repeats, they work great, there's quite a bit of variability in individuals. And so what is it? You basically have letters of DNA that repeat over and 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 over. So sometimes, you know, 50 times it repeats. And so what does that look like? Well, if we have these three individuals, we'll call this Mr. Blonde, Mrs. Red, and then Mr. Mustache. And so if we look at these three people, their genes are going to be the same. But these STRs are going to be different. These single or short tandem repeats are going to be different. You can see that Mr. Blonde has more than Mr. Mustache and less than uh, Mrs. Red. And so if I make that a little bit easier to, to grasp onto, if I count them out, and then remove everything else, what we get is variability between all individuals. Everything else was the same, but we see variability in here. Um, and we can cut these sections out using restriction enzymes, and then we can amplify them using polymerase chain reaction, and then we can separate them using gel electrophoresis. So how does that work? Basically, I'll take the DNA and I'll put them in a little well, and so we're looking down on this, and so this is an agarose gel. I could put Mrs. Red's and then Mr. Mustache. I could put those all in DNA. Basically, I would then turn on the voltage. So there's going to be a positive charge here, negative charge up here. DNA is a negative charge, and so it's going to be pulled towards the positive. And so what's going to happen is those little fragments of DNA are going to migrate. And so what does that allow me to do? It allows me to tell the difference between each of these individuals. And so this is their fingerprint. But you can tell that this is a really bad fingerprint because we've got some... These two are exactly the same here, and so... In, when they really do DNA profiling, what they do is they generally use 13 different sections like this. And then those 13 sections are each going to be highly variable. And so it's a good way to tell who's who. When would we ever want to do this? Forensics is one reason. And then also in maternity, figuring out who's dad. And so let's talk about the murder. There was a murder that was committed. Somebody was brutally murdered by one of these three suspects. So Mr. Blonde, Mrs. Red, or Mr. Mustache. But they left blood at the scene. And so what I can do is I can grab samples of DNA from each of our um, suspects, and then I could grab the blood itself, and then I could do DNA fingerprinting on them. So before we separate them, you may think to yourself, which of these looks guilty? Who looks like they're capable of murder? And if we separate them then using that gel, what we can see is that Mr. Blonde is guilty. In other words, his blood matches up with the crime scene. And so how, what do I mean by matching up? Well, those single or those short tandem repeats, if we look vert horizontally, are going to be exactly lined up. 
And if we were to look at Mr. Blonde's son, we'd find more similarities than we would between the others. And so basically that's DNA profiling, DNA fingerprinting. It's much more sophisticated than that, but again, it's kind of on its way out. We'll eventually replace this with DNA sequencing. In the U.S., we, um, the FBI has started creating this database of DNA, which is a little scary. And basically what they use are 13 different areas within the chromosome or the genome, and then they're looking at those short tandem repeats in there. Um, now, why do I say that's a little bit scary? I think you really want to protect your DNA because as we learn more and more about genetics, what's going to be found in your DNA? Well, predisposition to Alzheimer's or breast cancer, any of these things, which your insurance company would love to get a hold of. And so, um, and it also doesn't answer the idea of Mr. Blonde, did he really do it? I mean, did the police frame him and then contaminate the blood? Um, so we don't know that. All it does tell us is if we have two samples of DNA, the odds of two people having the same DNA fingerprint are astronomical, unless they're identical, but I digress. And I hope that's helpful.